If you need a risk register template, you've come to the right place. If you already have a risk register template, but you're wondering if it could be a little bit better, you've come to the right place. If you're interested in risk categorization, you've also come to the right place. And if you like free project management templates, you have definitely come to the right place. In short, you're gonna get a risk register template for free and some project management knowledge to go along with it. I'm Stuart Taylor and I make videos about project management. If that's your thing, make sure to hit the subscribe button. Today I was gonna make a video about how to make a risk register template. And then I looked back at the footage and I thought, wow, that's really boring and really slow. And I thought, you know what? I'm just gonna give you the template. So without wasting any more time, I'm just gonna jump straight in, show you the template, give you a walkthrough. The link to the template is in the description of this video. So download that at your pleasure. I recommend though watching the walkthrough because this will explain how the template works, what different sections mean, and why I've included some things that maybe you haven't seen before. Okay, so here's the risk register template and you see it's fairly standard kind of stuff if you've seen these before, but I'm gonna go back to the start and I'll give you a quick walkthrough on what you can see here. Firstly, a section at the top here where you can include your details and the details of the project. I've deliberately not included a formula to put today's date in here. And the reason for that is you may want to save versions of this so that you've got an auditable trail of the work that you've been doing. And you may want this document to be a snapshot of your risk register. It's not the kind of thing you'll be asked for a lot, but on the one or two occasions when you do get asked, you'll be grateful to have had this version sitting there in your files that you can easily reach to and say, here you go. Here is the risk register with a snapshot of this particular date. It's worth adding that if you work on compliance related projects or regulatory projects, I would say you definitely need to do this. Next, you can see a standard risk heat map. This is based on the risk impacts and likelihoods that you can see in the tables over there on the right. Feel free to amend the colors on here as you see fit. In this case, any risk that is scoring over 10 causes the risk to turn amber. Anything over 20 turns it red. You may need to recalibrate this depending on the needs of your organization. I'll put very generic titles on here. Feel free to change them as you see fit. You'll see over here, the risk likelihood runs up to 99%. Don't forget if something is 100% likely, it's an issue, not a risk. Okay, the first column on here is the risk ID. This is where you put a unique identifier for your risk. This is really useful if you're dealing with people who are having to look at lots of risks from lots of different projects where the risk names may be similar. Having a unique identifier is gonna help you to find the right risk. The risk name is just a simple, memorable name that just gives a title to the risk description. Often the risk descriptions can be too long to just reel off, so it's better to have a risk name to hand as well. The risk description is where you actually put the description of what the risk is, its cause, and its impact. Try to be concise, try to get to the point. I have other videos on the channel about how to write good risk descriptions. You should really go and check them out. Next, you want to include the date the risk was captured. This is really helpful for determining how old a risk is, how long it's been sitting on your register for. The risk owner is the lucky person who gets to own and manage and deal with this risk. Sadly, until you've identified an owner, it's probably gonna be the project manager who ends up being the risk owner, but that should only be temporary until you can find a more suitable person to own the risk. The risk owner doesn't have sole responsibility for dealing with the risk though. They can still delegate tasks and actions to other people. Hey, if you're getting value from the video, don't forget to give it a like. And if you wanna support the channel, please share the video and other videos from the channel with your friends and colleagues. Okay, now we're into the risk scores. This is the part that always gets interesting. You'll see that I've created three categories here for different points in the lifetime of the risk. We've got the pre-mitigation scores, which are the scores of the risk as soon as it was identified. Then we've got the current score, which after you've been mitigating this risk, hopefully the impact or the likelihood score is gonna to start to drop. And then we've got the post-mitigation scores. And what this covers is the target score that you want to get that risk managed down to. It's not unusual for an organization to only be interested in one of these scores, usually the current score. I have worked at places where the current score and the post mitigation score is all that people are interested in. Feel free to use this template however you see fit. You can delete these columns or you can hide them depending on the needs of the business. If you're working somewhere that doesn't have too much oversight and there aren't established standards and templates for doing this, my recommendation is that you use all of these columns. 
it's always better to have a little bit more information than you think you need. Because I can tell you, it is very difficult to go backwards in time and try to remember what pre-mitigation scores were. The scores on the impact columns are looking at a lookup table, which is reflective of these scores here. So if you click on a three, that will be indicating a moderate level risk. If you click on a four, then it's significant and so on. Similarly, if you click onto one of these levels here for the likelihood, it's reflecting the values in this table. So if you say, well, it's a four, this is quite a bad risk because it's significant and it's likely. And that's why it's coming up as amber. These lookups and the conditional formatting are applied to the current scores and the post mitigation scores, and they're copied all the way down. Next, we're interested in the risk response. How are you going to deal with this risk? This is a drop down again, looking at this table here with various strategies on how to manage risks. Next, we have a section to include your mitigation plan and actions. Like any good plan, this should be a list of actions, tasks, deliverables, each with an owner, each with a target date. In the progress column, you can include an update on how each of the mitigating actions are progressing. One thing that I found to be really helpful for tracking the progress on here is to make sure that your mitigation plan has numbered actions and your progress is also numbered to correspond to the numbers of the actions. Next, we've got a column for risk proximity. You can put a date in there if you've got an exact date or you can put a duration if it's approximate. If you're not quite sure what risk proximity is, I have made another video about this. Please check it out on the channel. It may be that you've chosen to deliver the project through having multiple work streams. If so, and the risk is specific to a work stream, feel free to drop its name in this column here. Oh, this is the one that always puzzles people. Operational or project risk. If you're being a good project manager, you're capturing all sorts of risks as you identify them. And I dare say most of them will impact things like your costs, your time scales, and your scope. Most of those kind of things will fall into the category of being a project risk. But if you identify a threat that will impact on the company's reputation or company's stability or its market position or anything like that, where the risk is impacting something outside of the project, the very organization itself, then it's worth identifying that here. Escalation level is one that you're gonna to need to calibrate to your own organization. Some people like to use a numerical system for that, but there's no reason you can't just put what governance forum this is going to be escalated to. The last review date and the next review date. These are the two cells and you may want to leave them out if you're a project manager because these are the ones where PMOs always catch out project managers who've not been keeping on top of their risks. Every time you review your risk and update it, you need to bring this last review date up to date and you also need to plot when you're going to review it again next. By doing this, you make yourself a little bit more accountable and it's more likely you're going to be reviewing your risks in a consistent and standard way. Target completion date is another one that sometimes catches project managers out. It's the date you expect the risk to have been fully managed. So put a date in there when you think the risk will be managed, but then go back and have a look at your mitigation actions and see if this date is consistent with the last activity that takes place in that plan. Historical progress is a useful overflow section for if you've made so many progress updates against your mitigating plan, you might wanna just copy and paste some of the older progress updates into here and then hide this, just so it doesn't end up distorting the whole sheet. And finally, notes. Where would we be without a section called notes where you can put any other random thoughts and ideas that you have about a risk? Every table needs a notes column. If you've enjoyed this video, give it a like. If you think I've missed something off this template, it's possible, then let me know in the comments. I'll look forward to hearing your feedback. As I mentioned, the download link to this template is in the description. Before you go running off with the template though, I encourage you to click on the link up here to see a video about how to write really effective risk descriptions. On the other hand, YouTube seems to think you're gonna like that video. I don't know. You let me know which one you prefer.